Buenos dias todos. Um, I want to start. One, one, one second. Okay. Melody's going to introduce you first. Oh, okay. Do, do you want to use this to stand up? Uh, I'm fine just holding this. Okay. Do you want to just introduce me for a minute and then we'll begin? We'll just breathe a little faster this morning. <laughs> It is my pleasure to introduce Dr. Jonathan Hill to give today's main address, Fishes, Forests, and Indigenous Amazonian Peoples. Dr. Hill has been a professor of anthropology at Southern Illinois University at Carbondale, and his area of specialty is South American history and ethnology. He received his bachelor's degree from the University of Chicago and his doctorate from Indiana University. Jonathan has also been a member of Ethical Society for over 20 years and includes education, environmental issues, and racism among his interests as well as piano performance as a lifelong passion. So let's give a warm welcome to Dr. Jonathan Hill. Thank you for the introduction. Okay, uh, yes, I've been a member here for more than 20 years. I joined in 1999. I think I read about uh, some of the services that were going on here. It was during Black History Month or February around my birthday and I had a little loft that I rented over in the Central West End. And when I read about what the service was, I thought, that sounds really interesting. And I came in here and when they read the core values and they said one of them was I am free to question. I said, okay, I think I want to join this group because uh, a PhD in cultural anthropology, as I've told my wife Sharon many times, is a license to be as nosy as possible and ask as many questions as you want. Um, is the sound? Oh, yeah. Uh, as an undergraduate at the University of Chicago in the 1970s, I studied anthropology and fell in love with the idea of cultural anthropology as a, it's really a space of translation. I mean, how do we uh, create spaces for cult intercultural understanding without mistranslating? And it's not just a process of translating language, it's a, a much more complex process of translating meaning. So I was also very interested in music and I was studying at the American Conservatory of Music in, in the Loop in Chicago every week, piano performance. And at the end of my freshman year, I caught a, a lucky break uh, and auditioned for and was accepted in the piano performance seminar at Tanglewood Institute, which is part of the Boston University Tanglewood Institute in Lenox, Massachusetts, which is where my family lives, lived at that time. So I spent three summers there doing nothing but soaking up uh, music from the Boston Symphony Orchestra and incredible piano performers like Andre Watts. Uh, so I was very fortunate to get that. And I want to say thank you to the musicians today. I thought it was really beautiful. And another reason I was uh, immediately attracted to this society is the emphasis they place on music, especially uh, acoustic classical music like we just heard here. And most of you, if you've seen me up here on platform before, have seen me sitting over there behind that keyboard on that piano because that's what I have done uh, so much of. 
Um, the other day I just happened to be walking from one room to the next and saw my old copy of An Ethical Philosophy of Life presented in its main outlines by F Felix Adler, the founder of the ethical movement. And how many uh, people here have a copy of the Blue Book? Okay, not too many. I kind of assumed it was just a, a routine procedure that everybody got one of these when they joined, and I think it wouldn't be a bad idea to uh, reinstate that practice. When I joined in 1999, everyone, all the new members, I don't know, Joe, were you a new member in 99? So you got a, a blue book too, right? Yeah. Well, it sat on my shelf for many years without, I did read it when, when we had a, a kind of a class with the leader at that time who was Judy Toth. Um, and in the introduction by Judith Espensheed, who's the leader of the Philadelphia Ethical Society. She wrote this in 1986. She said, the contents are now dated in terms of language and style, yet under the cover of Germanic sentence structure and questionable moralizing on specific issues lies the most systematic explanation of Felix Adler ever gave of his religious vision. For the ethical cultural movement which he founded, this book is both a source of historical perspective on our evolutionary faith and a resource on social and ethical questions which still live today. My f personal feelings are mixed about this book and its author. He would not approve of a leader who was female or once divorced or lacking a doctoral degree. He was unhappy with pacifists who more than once created divisions in the, in the movement. I, on the other hand, am troubled both personally and institutionally by the stance of an authoritarian with fixed and Victorian judgments on political, social, personal, and sexual morality. You know, that said, I went into the book the other day, I went into the living room, sat down and started reading it, and was immediately struck by two things. One is our basic uh, principle, which is, I think, just respecting all individual people. According to uh, Adler, the ideally ethical act, to my mind, is the most completely individualized act. Um, and that uh, resonated very clearly with my own feeling, which is this, if you show proper interest and respect for each individual that you uh, engage with in your professional and personal life, uh, that, you know, kind of what goes around comes around. And uh, the next paragraph goes on to say, what is true of individuals is no less true of peoples. No people can really be exemplary for other peoples. And in this sense, elect. Every people possesses a character of its own to which it is to give expression in ways which I shall indicate in the last part of this work. I found that to be quite consistent with my own uh, training as a cultural anthropologist that um, when we translate and create intercultural understanding, we're, we're not just trying to translate uh, indigenous 
languages into our own language, but we're also trying to transcribe and understand their language and their stories in, uh, in their language. And we're interested in the particularities and specificities of each language and dialect, as well as even the specific ways in which some individuals are very talented storytellers uh, and those are the individuals we can work with very closely to get not only stories, but stories about stories. So we need to understand how stories are grouped together into genres of storytelling and then how those stories are related to other verbal artistry, such as chanted and sung uh, speeches that are performed in rites of passage, at childbirth, at uh, uh, puberty, um, after uh, deaths, and so forth. But um, when I was reading, I, I was using this old piece of paper as a bookmark, and, after, and it's all these scribbled hand notes, handwritten notes that I took uh, during the class that Judy Toth taught for the first four or five weeks uh, for the newcomers. And I realized at one point that what I had uh, as a bookmark was a letter from Judy Toth, it's because it said, sincerely, Judy Toth, senior leader. So I opened it up and found underneath all my scribbling a letter. Dear Jonathan, I would like to personally invite you to a class I am teaching which will go deeply into the thought of Felix Adler, founder of the ethical culture movement. This is a good chance for you as a new member or relatively new to enrich your understanding and bolster your emotional commitment to what we stand for. Lunch will be part of our format, exclamation mark. Bring your own brown bag. I want this to be a convivial event as well as educational. The course runs for three Sundays, March through April. We have lunch together at 12.30 and then explore Adler's ethical philosophy of life from 1 to 3 p.m. I'm inviting you to attend, attend as my guest. Call Bob Greenwell to register. Bob Greenwell was like a, a leader in training, I believe. Uh, inform him that you are RSVPing to my inv invitation. And actually since we're going through a pretty big transition in terms of personnel here. Uh, a new leader, a new music director, and a new Sikh director. We're, we're in a kind of a, a, a betwixt and between rite of, uh, rite of passage. We're in that transitional uh, period of, which can be both creative and also presents the possibility of um, sort of too much centrif centrifugal forces that everything kind of flies apart into chaos. So um, I would suggest that maybe we, we go back to having everyone get a copy of the Blue Book, taking a look at it, spend more time just introducing things. Um, first, I'd like to express my gratitude to several people, two of whom, three of whom are sitting right here in the front row. First, my wife, Sharon de Grief, who has fallen on her sword to be my caregiver since 
July 18th of 2021, which was a, a dark day for me, I suffered from a seizure while I was standing in my kitchen. And as I fell to the ground, either I hit something on the way to the ground or I landed in the wrong way and dislocated my left shoulder. And as bad as the seizure and the dislocation were, they probably saved my life because I was taken immediately by the paramedics in an ambulance to Mercy Hospital on New Ballast Road. And in the emergency room, they did a CT scan and found that I had a brain tumor, a prim primary brain tumor, a glioblastoma, which was fairly large. And fortunately, they were able to surgically remove it. It was close to the surface of my uh, head on the right side. It was about five centimeters in length, so it was quite big. Um, you know, we had uh, all kinds of uh, genetic testing done on the tumor itself and didn't really reveal a whole lot except that I have what's called unmethylated DNA, which is not good because that means that my, my body tends to produce a, a fairly large amount of a protein that blocks or interferes with the chemotherapy. And chemotherapy is already uh, difficult when you have a primary brain tumor because it's, on the, it's protected by the blood-brain barrier. I'd also like to thank uh, Jeanette Langdon, the chair of the Committee of Concern, for coming over to my house to meet with me a couple of times. Uh, and she brought along a friend of mine who's a member here that many of you know, Carol Bartell. Uh, and that was very helpful. Uh, I'm thanking Joe Corrigan for taking the time to drive me over to uh, Siteman Cancer Center where I was getting radiation treatments five days a week. And I can't drive now. And I won't be able to drive until the end of this, this until the end of this calendar year because I had a seizure in early June, and I couldn't drive from July of last year to January of this year because of the seizure. Again, seizures are bad things, but in this case, both times it happened when I was at home, and I was able to be get taken to a hospital very quickly and they found the cause of the seizure, which had I not had the seizure, they might not have known it was there. Um, Joe Corrigan took me over to Siteman Cancer Center for my radiation treatment on a couple of occasions. He also, because we share a common interest in classical music, he took me to the uh, St. Louis Symphony Orchestra twice, which was great because otherwise I've just been completely housebound. Um, I also want to just uh, mention that I'm the father of two sons, Alexander, who was born in 1979, and his half-brother, different mothers, Charlie, who was born in 2002. And both of them came to visit me immediately as they heard about my medical issues, which is unusual because Charlie's over at Indiana now, in Bloomington. He's going into his third year of undergraduate study and Alex is a restaurant manager and chef at the International, Tampa International Airport in Florida. So it's very unusual to have both of them visiting me at the same time. Um, and I, I have, Alex has one son, Colin, who was born in 2012. 
And I would have to say probably the most amazing thing about becoming a grandfather is not just becoming a grandfather per se, but seeing my son Alex becoming a father. He's a very devoted father and that means everything to me. I also want to put in a little bit of a plug for anthropology. Um, for some reason, anthropology seems to be very misunderstood. I think Hollywood has done part of the uh, essentializing and mystifying uh, of anthropology. When I say that I'm a cultural anthropologist, people think, oh, Indiana Jones or something like that. You go clambering around in ancient tombs filled with poisonous snakes and other dangerous animals. But actually, uh, it shouldn't really be that mystical. Uh, anthrop anthropology simply means anthroposology. Anthropos is the Greek word for homo sapiens sapiens, for human beings. So anthropology is the study of human beings. But it, it tends to be a non-starter when, when I tell people I'm a, an emeritus professor, I taught an cultural anthropology for 40 years. It's not as if I'm saying I taught psychology. Psychology, everybody would say, oh yeah. So they, 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 most of them have taken a course in it when they were in college or something. And I think because our culture tends to be rather uh, overly individualistic, whenever something like a mass shooting happens, some 18-year-old gets his hands on a military-grade we weapon and goes into a school and shoots up a bunch of children, uh, the media immediately turns to psychology for explanations what, you know, what was wrong in terms of the mental health of this individual 18-year-old who committed this atrocious crime. And it's only in very recent times that we finally are starting to hear the media talk about the culture of gun violence and, and the culture of gun, the gun culture as maybe part of the problem. And that if we're gonna really do anything to resolve the problem, we need to look at it on a collective level, not just a, a, a individual, not to mention the fact that it's, it's not necessarily a good thing to stigmatize uh, individuals who are suffering from mental health problems by kind of essentializing them as likely to be um, violent or a criminal. Um, one very nice way to understand anthropology uh, comes from a, a saying that was written by Eric Wolf. He said, anthropology is the most humanistic of the sciences and the most scientific of the humanities. So anthropology, I look at it as it's a social science, which is equally uh, connected to biological science and humanistic studies of language, music, and, and uh, culture in general. And this is only the four field approach to anthropology uh, has only um, emerged in the United States. Uh, in the United Kingdom and Europe, there isn't the same emphasis on integrating biological science with the humanistic study of uh, other languages and cultures. 
And this is largely due to the uh, influence of the founder of American anthropology, F Franz Boas. Uh, in 1896, he gave a very important paper at the American Association for the Advancement of Science, which was called a Critique of Racial Formalism. Let's not forget, 1896 was also the year when the Supreme Court of the United States passed Plessy versus Ferguson, which basically gave legal institutional support to racial apartheid in the American South. It was the so-called separate but equal doctrine. Um, and at that time, the predominant theories of human diversity were incredibly ethnocentric and racist. It's sometimes called uh, the period of scientific racism. I would put quotations, scare quotes around the word scientific. I think it would be better called pseudo-scientific uh, racism. Basically, they were very rationalistic classifications of different cultures. And cultures like the one I worked with, worked on for the last 40 or so years, 42 years in Amazonia, were uh, looked down on and they were classified as barbaric or uh, worse, savage. They were just called savages or barbarians. Um, so Boaz was part of this sort of Neo-Kantian Germanic uh, philosophical movement in the mid-19th century. And actually Boaz and Felix Adler knew each other. Both of them participated in anti-racist conferences that were held, I believe, in London, somewhere over in the United Kingdom. Uh, and, and there's an entire chapter in the Blue Book about the Kantian critique of pure reason. So, so we have, I think, a common uh, history there. Folks, we're going to move the discussion of the indigenous people's music to the Q&A afterwards, where I will sit with Jonathan and we will listen to the music that he brought and answer questions. I want to thank you for the thoughts about Felix Adler and also for your membership of this community over so many years. You're an incredibly important part of our collective lives, and I certainly appreciated the opportunity for to hear about how your life has been these last few months and also your thoughts on the blue book. I think we should definitely give everyone a copy of the blue book. We have tons of them in my office. So if you, if you want to, literally, I think they, they really printed more than anyone could possibly want to buy of that book. So if you want to come and get a copy, I'm sure you can swing by and get one. Can we thank Jonathan? And then if you'd like to hear the music. 
You can stay in the Q&A afterwards.